And with this, I would like to welcome you to this uh, first ENCCS Accelera training on NEC 5000. Um, so we have uh, the whole day today uh, to essentially trying to show you how to use NEC 5000. And we chose uh, to have a more general approach to this. We would like to start first with um, an introduction on uh, CFD in general, some of the key uh, issues that one may encounter when, when doing um, CFD or computational fluid dynamics. Um, then we have one part on a more theoretical level on uh, the spectral element method on which NEC 5000 is based on, um, just to also give you a formal background to the actual discretization and perhaps also the beneficial properties of NEC 5000 that, that may be useful when, when doing CFD uh, simulations. And then we have in the later part of today, one hour before lunch and then the whole afternoon, um, we have a number of hands-on sessions um, during which the idea is that you will download the software, NEC 5000, you will compile it, install it, and then eventually also run and modify um, some, uh, some NEC 5000 code. So the goal for uh, today, at the, end of the, uh, at the end of today, would be that you can run on your own um, a, um, a NEC 5000 simulation and you know more or less where and how to um, modify uh, the code if, if, if necessary. Um, with this said, I would like to now start with the first part of our uh, agenda, and that was the short introduction um, and uh, the, some words about the organization and, and who's actually standing behind this, this, um, this one-day training. I prepared a few slides here about that. Well, first of all, um, there is uh, three people that will guide you through the various uh, slide sets uh, and hands-ons uh, today. Um, that is Adam Peplinski here on the top. Um, he's uh, working at uh, engineering mechanics as a researcher, and he's our application expert in NEC 5000. We have um, Niklas Jansson, he works at the, at the computer center uh, PDC, also at KTH, and he's an expert on uh, parallel algorithms. And um, finally, it's, it's me, Philip Schlatter, I'm uh, also working at uh, engineering mechanics, and my area of expertise is essentially doing CFD simulations and um, uh, post-processing of uh, turbulent flows. Um, as I was uh, saying, um, this tu tutorial today is essentially made possible with the, um, with the support of two organizations. Um, first, we have ENCCS, that's the EuroCC National Competence, Cent Competence Center in Sweden, and the Accelerat um, Center of Excellence for Industrial uh, Simulations. And um, for both of these centers, I have a few slides now that will uh, shortly summarize what the idea of these, uh, these two centers are. Um, we start with the Accelerat uh, Center and uh, Niklas, uh, who's the, um, the coordinator of um, Accelerat in uh, Sweden, he will shortly guide us through the, the next uh, two, three slides. Yes, thank you. So good morning. So. Um... Accelerat is this European Center of Excellence for Engineering Applications. As you see on the map, it contains on, on 13 partners, mostly academic and HPC centers in Europe. And it contains uh, several core codes, uh, use cases, and also we're covering different application area. So you can go to the next one, Philip. And the vision of Accelerat is really to strengthen uh, the competitiveness of uh, European engineering industry. And the way this is done is by using the accumulated knowledge we have for example, in academia of running at scale and try to combine this with knowledge from industry to advance the state of the art for running engineering simulations in Europe. So next one. And uh, how this is done in practice is that we are developing this workflow, everything from pre-processing, simulation, post-processing, and uh, all these loops into sort of service offerings such that uh, engineering partners and also academic partners can approach Accelerat and get help of, of sort of the transition from current parallel workflow or even serial workflow towards Exascale as well. And just the last one is just a list of the different codes. You see it have a mix of open source codes and large academic codes in Europe. And at the bottom there you see you have NEC 5000, which is covered by two different uh, use cases in this center. Thank you. Um, thank you, Niklas, for this uh, short summary. The second um, funding body for, um, for uh, this um, event today is um, ENCCS. 
And as I was saying, this is the, um, the National Competence Center in Sweden for EuroCC. And EuroCC, that's on the first slide here, um, is essentially um, uh, the consortium of, I think, most, most of the European countries that, will, um, that builds together um, European expertise in um, HPC, setting up uh, computer centers, centers, running simulations there, but also doing post-processing uh, keywords, HPDA and um, artificial uh, intelligence. The uh, ENCCS is the, the local, let's say, body, body of um, uh, EuroCC in, in Sweden. That's the National Competence Center, which was founded last September. So it's now roughly one year, uh, one year old. It's a collaboration between um, the, uh, the host, which is Uppsala University, and the physical address it, at KTH in, in, in Stockholm. Um, you can see here some contact information if you would like to know more about ENCCS. Um, there's a number of uh, people that work or are associated with ENCCS, particularly also the uh, director, Lilith, who have seen here as well. I think she's uh, part of this, uh, this meeting today um, as well. But there's a, a number of uh, application experts that each of them has a, a specific focal area uh, in which he or she will um, help the, the, the Swedish um, uh, HPC um, community. So what is ENCCS doing? Well, it's essentially the idea is to, to help Swedish researchers and uh, as a, both from academia and industry um, to be able to use these large scale computational resources. And one main aspect um, to doing that is via offering specific trainings. One of the trainings that you uh, that you're experiencing uh, right now. And there's, there's various levels, as you can see here also on this, um, on this slide uh, of, of this, uh, this training, um, that ranges really from uh, tutorials like today to hackathons, um, but also help in uh, when, you, when you write uh, proposals for, um, for exascale um, machines. Yeah, this was the, the summary of the two funding bodies, um, uh, Accelerate and uh, ENCCS. With this, I would directly go further to today's schedule. As I was mentioning before, um, we will start with two overview sessions, one on CFD in general, and then another one on the spectral element method and um, you know, what, what the, the benefits of this discretization uh, is. Uh, the last hour before lunch will then be a tutorial on, on how to install and run NEC 5000. So we will go through all the steps that are necessary to download, install, and um, setting up a first um, example case. And then after lunch, we will have a, a number of hands-on sessions, plus also a description of um, the specific KTH framework, which we be, uh, put together to hopefully uh, simplify the use of NEC 5000 for, um, for turbulent uh, flows mainly. Now, how this works today um, is that the theory uh, sessions are in this Zoom room. Uh, so we will essentially talk here and uh, show the slides. If you have any questions during the, during the event, uh, we ask you to either write them down in the chat and then uh, maybe Adam or Nicholas or, uh, or I will answer them directly or um, raise your virtual hand so that in case we have um, a possibility, we can then um, address this, uh, this question. Please do not directly interrupt um, the, the, the speaker. During the hands-on hands sessions in the afternoon, we will also open up the breakout rooms where one can then address specific problems or questions that may, may not be of uh, sufficiently general nature that it's important for everybody. At this point, I would also like to mention that for the hands-on sessions to be useful, you would need to be able to, to actually try out uh, the various things that we show. And therefore, the prerequisites to be able to participate in, participate in the hands-on sessions would be that you actually have a, a Linux uh, computer available. And what we need to um, download and compile Mac 5000 is, is not much, but, but still you need um, C and the Fortran compiler you need access to MPI, typically an open MPI installa installation. If you wanna look at the results, you would need to have um, a VTK type of software, so either Visit or, or Paraview. 
And then um, if you want to do also the meshing, you would need to install a G mesh, which is uh, quite straightforward to do on a Linux machine. Um, NEC 5000 is written in Fortran 77, or part of it is in Fortran 77. So therefore you would need to have some basic knowledge on Fortran 77. Um, as you may know, we have put together a number of slides on, on the homepage, which, um, which are intended as a, as a crash course for you to give you kind of a basic idea of Fortran 77 if you, if you have knowledge of any other uh, programming language. Um, Last but not least, uh, I said it all at in the beginning, uh, all, the uh, all the lectures and the hands-on sessions then, or well, the results of the hands-on sessions are being recorded. Um, so again, if you do not wanna appear on, on the recording, make sure that you turn off your camera and change your name. That is perfectly fine to do. Yes, this was all I wanted to say um, in the beginning before we start with the various lectures. So at this point, I would like um, to actually uh, stop with two poll questions that I prepared, which I would just like to, um, to get your, your feedback on. So the first question, which you should now be able to see, is um, for us to know whether you have actually used NEC 5000 in the past. Um, so whether you, you actually know of the codes that we're uh, talking about. So if you could just... Uh, Answer. Okay, so if I close this now and I can also show it to you. So it seems that about uh, a little bit more than half have never used NEC 5000. And I think that's also very good for the, um, for, for the scope of, of the course today. It will really give you, um, it, it will give you an overview of how to install and, and use NEC 5000 in its latest. Um, version. I also have a, a second uh, poll, which I would like to be um, interested in knowing the result. Namely, when we talk about CFD in general, um, so my question would be, uh, if you have not used NEC 5000, do you actually have experience in uh, doing CFD, computational fluid dynamics, in any other way? And uh, you can choose here which codes you may have used um, in the in the past. <clears throat> okay. okay. Of course, now I realize I should have had an option no code, but I assume that was would have gone into other. But it seems that um, quite a few have actually used different types of codes, open foam fluency effects, um, and uh, yeah, obviously some some also like process. So it seems that we actually have uh, quite a diverse uh, audience today, which of course also means that in case you feel that something is too trivial or too basic, um, then I guess you just have to bear with us uh, for a bit until we go to some topics that you may not have heard before. Similarly, if you think that something is too fast, uh, please let us know in the chat so that we can also focus a little bit more on, on aspects that you may not have understood. Okay, so with this, I would actually like to stop the, or uh, to end the first part. Um, are there any questions or any comments that you already may have at this point? Okay, then um, I will directly go on to the uh, introduction to um, CFD. I just need to change my slide set here. So let me do that like this. So Okay, <clears throat> so you're, you're seeing my slides now, I hope. Okay. Yeah, so as I, as I was saying, uh, the, first, uh, the first lecture will be on uh, uh, CFD in general, kind of the main issues or problems with uh, CFD that, that we may 
encounter. And now the slide doesn't change. So that works. Um, so I would like to start with a short motivation for CFD or let's say turbulence um, in, in general. I'll have a, a few slides on history of CFD, um, something about numerical meth methods in general, turbulence modeling, and then at the end, uh, some examples of what is actually possible, both CFD in general, but then also more specifically with um, NEC 5000. I will go through the slides quite quickly because I realize now after the poll that uh, most of you already have uh, quite some knowledge on, on CFD, but I hope that at least some of the slides are, are interesting to, uh, to everyone. So CFD typically is used for uh, the prediction or the simulation of uh, turbulent flows. And therefore maybe the first question is why is turbulence important? And um, I, I tend to use this slide here because I think it's a, it's a very nice illustration of why uh, the study of fluid mechanics or, or turbulence has become important during the last years and most probably is also um, relevant for, for quite some future. Um, what you see here is the, the number of kilometers a person does uh, per year. And um, what, you can, what you can realize here is that essentially the, the number of, of kilometers that a person covers every day is growing exponentially at this for the last two, 300 years. And uh, of course, then the means of transportation have changed during the years. And now we're mainly in this area where, where many things are of course dominated by means like trains, uh, cars, and uh, airplanes, all of them to a large extent depend on uh, fluid mechanics or turbulence in, in some sense. Um, well, why is it important? Well, I guess um, you, have, you all know the issue of the golf ball and the friction of, um, of a golf ball in air. And this is very much uh, related to, uh, to turbulence. As you know, um, if you have a, a smooth golf ball and you have um, you will have uh, separation quite early on. And this is because you have a laminar boundary layer that separates. And as soon as you make some sort of um, change or induce some sort of change into the flow, that you actually get a turbulent flow, you will see that the separation is much later and the golf ball flies much further. Now, of course, we're not really into the business of, of designing uh, cars or, or anything like that, but uh, this just means that understanding the dynamics and the, the, the changes that a turbulent flow induces into a flow are, of course, important to understand. Perhaps more relevant um, when it really comes to um, you know, exploiting certain characteristics of turbulent flows in, in, in order to get, for instance, skin friction reduction would be um, the, the, the skin of sharks, where you see these kind of fine grooves or riblets as they're called, and they can actually be modeled also numerically and um, have been shown to, to reduce the drag of a turbulent boundary layer, for instance. So that means understanding turbulence may actually have some very practical um, ramifications. Um, okay, now the, the, the next question is, okay, we understand turbulence in, is important, um, but still, why are we still here? Why are we uh, talking about doing simulations? Um, there is an interesting quote from 1975, where it um, was written in, in this specific paper that, um, well, the idea of a numerical experiment uh, came up, um, essentially saying that, well, if you have an advanced computer, a big computer, you can then replace all the wind tunnel testing, which I guess is still kind of a, a reasonable uh, statement. The interesting thing is also that um, in 1975, they made this prediction that you know, based on the development of computers at the time, that this would actually happen at some point in the 1980s that uh, computers will replace wind tunnel experiments. As we all know, this has not exactly happened in the same way. Um, it is maybe, it's not fully clear why uh, this, um, this, um, this delay, but I guess it has a lot to do with um, kind of the unexpected complexity and perhaps also the failure of uh, turbulence models to be really accurate in all, all types of um, uh, circumstance. But it still means, of course, that we're not there yet. And that means that CFD as such or simulations as such are still an active area of uh, research even nowadays. Um, my last um, motivation into why you know, CFD and turbulence is important is this, um, uh, this interesting um, uh, graph here, where essentially you see that if you 
are just interested in the total drag of an airplane, you can actually see that around 50% of this, uh, of this drag is related to frictional drag, which um, comes from wings, the fuselage, and, and, and the control surfaces and all of that. And of course, now the question is, okay, where does CFD, where does simulations come in? And it actually turns out that if you do the, if you do the, the, the math, if you calculate what is the resolution required to, to actually do a simulation of such an airplane, you actually um, find out that <clears throat> if you want to simulate um, such, a, such an airplane, you take an Airbus here at the cruise conditions, cruise speed, um, it actually would take um, around um, to, to, to get a, a result in one week for simulating one second of real time, um, you would need to have a, an exascale machine with a performance of around 40 exa uh, flow. So this is a machine that doesn't exist um, right now in, in the world. So that means um, we are still far, far away from being able to simulate actually the, the, the turbulent flow around a, a real body. The next thing I would like to um, uh, talk about very briefly is how to uh, put simulations or simulation results in uh, kind of the, the general framework of um, scientific uh, discovery, where of course, on one hand, you have experiments, you have theory and modeling, so, uh, you know, turbulence models or, or other uh, theories. And then as the third pillar, you would have uh, numerical simulations. Now, the problem is that all of these different approaches, they have different types of, of errors that may spoil uh, a specific um, um, result. Of course, you have here experimental issues, you have um, some simplifications in models. And of course, on the numerical side, you also have some issues which may be simple bugs, but it could also be uh, numerical errors um, that, that may spoil your, um, your uh, simulation or your results. So therefore, I think it's also very important to look at the connection between uh, these various boxes where we have the, uh, the, the terms that we have certainly all uh, talked about, validation and verifications. Uh, verification where essentially in verification, you look at the connection between the simulation and the, the, the models. In validation, you look at the, the, the outcome of the, of the simulation and experimental data. And then when it comes to model development, which is maybe not so relevant for us right now, um, would be kind of a confirmation of models with, um, with experiments. But I think it's always important to keep in mind that simulations or CFD in, in, in particular, is just one pillar um, in this uh, whole scientific, um, scientific um, uh, set. Now, having talked about this, the next question I guess could be, okay, now we know turbulence is important, CFD is important or simulations are important, but why is it such an issue to actually do um, simulations in CFD? Um, I stole here uh, a, a, a little bit from, from my, my lecture notes that I have in the course in CFD. I'm sorry about my, my handwriting here. Uh, well, if we just start from the, the, the governing equations here, I wrote down the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations in, <clears throat> in a typical way that we would uh, formulate them. So we have here on the first line, we have the momentum equation, the conservation of momentum. Second line here is the conservation of mass. Um, you will directly see that this is kind of a, a closed system. We have four, four unknowns, the velocity and the pressure, and we have um, four equations, three momentum equations, one uh, continuity equation. But what is really the problem here? Well, I guess the main issue that you can see here is and, and I guess that makes it most complicated in particular for incompressible flows, is that the continuity equation here acts as a constraint to the momentum equation. There is no time derivative of the pressure involved. The pressure is not even involved in the, um, in the continuity equation, um, which means that you need to solve the continuity equation kind of as a, as a supplement, as, a, as I said before, as a constraint in order to make sure that the velocity field evolves on a, on a, on a divergence-free um, subspace. And this, this really makes um, the, the, the solution of the, or the time integration of the Navier-Stokes equation extremely cumbersome um, numerically. So essentially, I wrote that down, down uh, once more here. So first of all, we have realized that it's a, it's a PDE, second order. Um, it's nonlinear, as maybe I haven't mentioned, but this term here 
is the, the nonlinear term, which is the root of all turbulence that we have at the end of the day. But then the main thing is that we have no time derivative for, for the pressure. Now, <clears throat> this exactly gives us these uh, cumbersome uh, solutions. And also, I think it's important to, to realize that um, mathematically speaking, uh, the Norwich Stokes equations are actually of uh, what we call mixed type. So we have some elliptic aspects uh, for the pressure. We have some uh, parabolic aspects that come from the, from the viscosity, but also the nonlinearity, which acts as a hyperbolic, um, uh, which has a, a hyperbolic uh, properties. Now, one, in my view, quite nice way of, um, of illustrating in a very obvious way why it is so difficult to get um, uh, numerical solutions to the Norwich Stokes equation. It's a simple example. Just think of a very long pipe with a fluid inside, and you have a hammer, and you, you hammer on one side of, uh, of, this, uh, of this pipe onto this uh, fluid. Now, the question is, how quickly would this pressure wave that you induce by hammering on it go into the pipe and come out on the other side or be felt on the other side. Now, if you're in the context of compressible flows, of course, then you have a, a finite um, speed of sound in which this pressure wave would, um, would propagate. But in the context of incompressible flows, your um, speed of sound would be infinite. So your Mach number would go to zero, your, your speed of sound would go to uh, infinity. So that means that the hammering here will be felt instantaneously at the other end of the, of the pipe. Of course, that means that if you now think of a numerical discretization of this, so if you, if you were to kind of put the, <coughs> put the mesh here in this, in this pipe, if you hammer on it, um, you would directly feel instantaneously this on the other side. And this means that in each time step, every grid cell essentially has to communicate with every other grid cell in order to make sure that this pressure wave can travel at infinite uh, speed. Now, this is exactly the issue of, uh, of CFD in, in the context of NEC 5000 that we also talk about. We have this uh, global coupling between all the modes, um, which just reflect this physical principle of having infinite um, uh, speed of sound. Okay. Now, having talked about the, the issues, the next uh, thing I would like to very briefly mention is a little bit about the history of CFD, just that you, that you have an idea of where this all um, uh, comes from. Well, I guess the first person that actually started to think about numerical solutions to, you know, to the governing equations was, was uh, the meteorologist Louis Fry Richardson, um, who was a pioneer in you know, in, in many areas, Richardson extrapolation is just one, one example. But he also wrote this um, very forward-looking book um, in 1922, which you, which you see here. And this book actually had two major contributions that we still cite a lot today. The first one is actually somewhere hidden inside uh, the book, is this little, uh, little verse or, or poem that, that probably most of you have heard in a basic turbulence course. Um, which essentially introduced the concept of a turbulence, uh, turbulent cascade, where he talks about big whirls and little whirls and feed on uh, their velocity up to uh, the viscosity. That is essentially the start of the, the idea of you have a turbulent uh, cascade, which I guess can be illustrated quite nicely if you just look at the, a very highly turbulent flow, where essentially you see that you have smaller and smaller, smaller, smaller scales, and the, the energy is kind of going there. Of course, also this concept has a, um, ramifications on numerical simulations, meaning that you need to, a, a, a lot of uh, fine resolution at, uh, in order to resolve everything. But the other um, interesting aspect that uh, Louis Fry Richardson had in his book was the idea of a forecast factory, um, where uh, the idea was that you would have individual computers working together on doing a forecast or, or a simulation. Of course, in his time, 100 years ago, he had no idea about computers, so he was actually using human computers. And um, kind of a, a, an illustration of how this may have looked like in, in his view um, is shown here, where essentially you have a big globe, which corresponds to the Earth. I mean, don't forget, he was a meteorologist. And 
each of these little squares would correspond to a grid point or a, or a cell where you have a bunch of people working, computing inside. And then you have here kind of the master node in the middle, which then makes sure that all these nodes communicate with each other. So in a sense, this is um, the archetype of a modern parallel computer where you essentially do message passing between all these different, um, these different cells. When it then comes to, well, this, uh, when it comes to real simulations kind of in using a, a computer, I guess the starting point was somewhere in the 60s at the, at the American National Labs. And one of the first simulations is, uh, is taken from, from, from this paper um, when, uh, when people in, in the group of uh, Harlow and Fromm were uh, for the first time simulating a, a cylinder wake. And you can see here how nicely they actually got the, the von Karman vortex street. And this was done on barely 1,000 grip point, which of course is something that these days you can do um, on, on, your, on your mobile phone, essentially. In the 60s, um, or very soon thereafter, was also development of the first numerical methods. And I guess um, the, the pressure correction methods that we still use today to solve this issue that we talked about before, about the coupling of the momentum and the, and the continuity equations, were developed at the end of the 60s by Corin and uh, Temam, uh, which are still in use um, today. In the 70s, I guess, was the century of um, developing the first turbulence models. Um, the, the idea of a large eddy simulation came up right, by uh, Smagorinsky and, uh, and Deerdorf. The, the K epsilon uh, turbulence model, which is kind of the base of all turbulence models, was developed at, uh, at Imperial. Um, but also, and I guess that's, also, that's, that's quite important as well, the, the abbreviation CFD, which we use these days, has also been uh, coined at an AIAA uh, conference, sometimes at the turn of the, of the decade um, from the 60s to the, to the 70s. So this was really the, the start of, of doing CFD in the, in the sense that we use it today. And then starting from the 80s, I guess that's the history that we kind of know a little bit more ourselves. Things have become colorful, computers have become bigger. Um, and of course, a lot of new algorithms have been invented during the, the last um, you know, 20, 30 years. But I think it's important to realize that many of the codes, simulation codes that we use today, including NEC 5000, but not only NEC 5000, actually have their roots sometimes in the 80s. And that this, of course, has also to do with the fact that the, that modern, modern programming languages were for the first time introduced during that time. Okay, um, now when it comes to numerical methods, this I think I can have very, very brief. Uh, so what is it actually when, or what are we actually doing when doing CFT? Well, in the end, we have our partial differential equation, in our case, the Navier-Stokes equations, and essentially we just wanna represent the Navier-Stokes equations on a discrete set of uh, grid points here indicated with a numerical grid. So essentially the idea is we would like to have a, a so-called grid function, which is a representation, a discrete representation of our solution, um, of our continuous uh, solution. And of course we have some ideas about convergence. Um, so we would like to get the right solution if we increase the, the, the resolution, etc. And how we do that is um, by going into the governing equations and trying to approximate all the derivatives that we have with some sort of discrete version of, of these derivatives. Now, this one here is, is just using Taylor series to show you how finite differences would work, where essentially you just take differences between neighboring points. But um, as uh, Niklas will show you in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, there's also other ways of, of how to do that in the spectral sense by using um, ansatz functions. Uh, but there's, there's various ways of how to do these derivatives. But essentially the idea is really you go from a continuous space into a discrete space where you can then, instead of having um, differential equations, you have difference equations or algebraic equations, which you can solve with a computer. One important concept here is the concept of the order of approximation. That essentially is the idea of how quickly the error that you commit here is uh, decaying. And if your error decays as a 
proportional to the grid spacing, delta x, you would call it a first order method. But as we will see later on as well, if you have an exponent to this delta x, you would have much faster conversions, meaning you have a high order method, which has a, a number of benefits. Once you have your discretization, you need to go into, onto a computer. Also this, I guess, is something you, you, you know. Um, our computers that we have been using during the last years have become faster and faster. The speed of a computer is typically measured in how many floating point operations you can do per second in flops or flop per second. And um, you can just see here what we call Moore's law that you have an exponential increase of this uh, computational power as a function of year. Um, I mean, this graph, I, as, I, as I said, I guess you all know it. I think it's just interesting to kind of put two kind of known computers into that, um, into that graph to, to give you an idea. The one computer that I chose um, has his point here, which is the Cray-1, um, which to some extent can be considered as the first real supercomputer for scientific use. It was actually the size of a, a very big sofa. So, I mean, you could, you could actually, you know, you could, you could, oops, you could really sit on this, um, on this computer here. Um, and it, it had one core and it had around 100 megaflop. Now, what is 100 megaflop? Well, you can compare that with an iPhone, which um, on, on this graph would be around here, so 2020, and it actually has already, I think it was two gigaflop. So um, it was already at that point uh, 20 times faster than this mainframe computer. So this really illustrates how much uh, increase in computer computer power we have experienced during the during the last years. But yet we're still far away from actually doing turbulence uh, simulations. Well, maybe the last slide here about, um, about computing, um, which I also personally think is quite interesting. Um, you could ask yourself how much of the computer time worldwide is actually used for doing simulations of you know, CFD in the broader sense, solving the Noir Stokes equations. And we actually checked that a few years ago um, at the, from the data from the um, Mira supercomputer at the Argonne. And it actually turns out that around 40% of the time in large computer centers is used to solve the Noir Stokes equations. Not only, of course, using NEC 5000 or, or, or these types of codes, codes, there's also climate codes and astrophysics codes, but still, it's quite a large fraction that is actually used for doing fluid dynamics related problems. Roughly, yeah, a little bit less than half of the time. But I guess that's important to keep in mind when, when talking about the CFD and, and the, the corresponding code. You know. <clears throat> okay, so now we have talked about computers and, 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 and numerics. Now maybe the, the next step would be to talk briefly about you know, what types of uh, CFD is actually possible. And uh, I classified this as um, physical models. And what I mean here is to talk about you know, DNS or direct numerical simulations and large eddy simulation and RANs. And we can do that very, very quickly because um, I guess you, you're mostly familiar with that. But also here, maybe a slight, uh, a short um, historical perspective. If we talk about direct numerical simulation or, or DNS as, as, as it's also called, um, this was actually, it was not the first concept for simulations that, that, that was introduced. The first concept really was on the, in the context of, uh, of LES or large eddy simulations or even turbulence models. Um, the term DNS was, um, was uh, coined by uh, Stephen Orsak um, in the 70s when he meant that direct means that this should be done directly from the governing equations. So directly from the Navier Stokes equations. So there's no, no model terms um, involved. And I guess the first simulation that really qualified as a DNS was the, the simulation by Orsak and Patterson in 1972 when they simulated homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So essentially turbulence in a box um, on 32 cubed uh, grid points. And DNS still the, these days is, is that um, that part of, of, of CFD that uses the most computer time may be very, very expensive. But of, of course, instead of doing boxes 32 to the cubes, 
um, right now people have actually done you know on the order of 20,000 points in each direction so 20,000 cubed uh, grid points which of course is a tremendous increase as compared to the but even so uh, dns which is uh, kind of the, the 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 red bit here in this in this plot is still far away um, from being able to recover um, you know, real flows, which are, you know, may, maybe atmospheric flows, aircrafts or ships, etc. So we're still kind of struggling, trying to extend the region where resolved simulations may actually be um, helpful for doing predictions. This now <clears throat> brings me to the, the next um, um, relevant topic, and that is, what is the influence of the Reynolds number, which you, you see here both on, on the upper and the lower axis, in terms of uh, prediction of uh, fluid flows. Now, the Reynolds number <clears throat> um, essentially tells you what is what the the the, the scale of uh, the, the range of scales is in a, in a specific flow. If you just think of a pipe flow, so there's a, a cross section, what you can think of is the the size of the smallest scales compared to the geometry. And an increase of Reynolds number, which I now show with these uh, four different pictures, just means that you see that the geometry, of course, is always the same. But what happens is that these small scales get smaller and smaller. And this, in this case, would mean that the Reynolds number would also increase. In this, ca in this case, I show a tenfold increase of Reynolds. And of course, now with this, you can directly see that if you, if you start to have smaller and smaller scales, the, the cost of the computation will go up tremendously because you need to resolve all these um, small scales. Um, okay, so this would be kind of the, the, the tip of the iceberg in this representation here where you have direct numerical simulation here on the top where the idea is that you have no turbulence model involved. But there is kind of also this, this lower part of, the, of the, the, the simulation pyramid where you start to use different types of models, different amount of modeling um, that, that is being used. And of course, the, uh, the, the key words that you certainly have heard about is um, LES, which is large eddy simulation, where the idea is that you only model the smallest scales, but you resolve the largest scales. And then you have the RAN side, which um, essentially means that you that you resolve um, only the um, the mean flow, and all the turbulence is uh, being modeled. And of course, this also has a, an important ramification on the relative importance of the numerics, which is indicated here with this with this red arrow. So that means the more you resolve the numerics per se, the accuracy is more and more important. Whereas of course, if you go down, you have an increase of the importance of an accurate modeling. And these are actually two different, uh, well, it's, it's, it's two different aspects with, uh, with arrows that point in two different directions. And I think that's also important to keep in mind when choosing a specific numerical method for, or code for doing um, solutions of these, uh, these different, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this pyramid. So for instance, if you do RANs, it may not be important what the order of the code is, whereas if you do a, a direct numerical simulation, the order of the method may be actually very relevant. Okay, <clears throat> now I would just like to show you um, two examples of, um, of DNS simulations that we have done during the last year to give you um, a, a quick idea of what it actually means to do a direct numerical simulations these days. I would like to start with one simulation that we did um, around 10 years ago, but I still think it's a kind of an illustrative way um, of, of understanding where the cost of a direct numerical simulation actually comes from. In this particular example, um, the idea was that we wanted to simulate the, the turbulent flow on a, on a flat surface. For instance, think of, a, of, the, of the wing of an airplane. Um, and we just chose uh, a, a very small box, 40, 50 centimeters in length, you know, 10 centimeters or so in, in width, and we try to simulate um, that part. And of course, then you can start to zoom in. And you can actually then see that there's tremendously many very small scales 
that are present. Um, and the, it's exactly these structures that essentially make sure that, that the turbulent flow um, has the friction properties, but also the, the, the pressure properties that in the end make sure that the airplane can, uh, can actually experience lift force. But now using simulations, it's not, you can not only look at these two dimensional representations, you can actually look at uh, a fully three dimensional view of the turbulent flow. And I have here um, a, a, small, a small video, which I guess we can skip the beginning here, but we can directly go into uh, the view of the velocity field. Now, you need to keep in mind this, this was done 10 years ago, so we couldn't store all the velocity fields. So what you have here is just one single velocity field. So there's no time dependence right now in the visualization. It's just one fixed velocity field where we just circle around with the camera to give you an impression of how a frozen field of turbulence would look like. Again, this whole thing would correspond to around 50 centimeters of length on an airplane wing. And here has all these beautiful vertical structures um, that are essentially filling uh, the whole space and on the surface of, a, of an airplane. So this was around uh, 10 years ago <clears throat> that we could do that. Um, around five years ago, or four, four years ago, um, let me turn this off. Um, around four years ago, we actually, oops, um, we could do slightly more complicated geometries. What we then chose again uh, from the aeronautical industry um, was trying to simulate um, uh, an airfoil wing. In this case, we took a glider airplane because that was kind of what could be reached at, at that time. And using now with NEC 5000, we could actually do curved geometries. And we tried to simulate the turbulent flow around such, um, such a, a streamlined body. Now, skipping this, I can directly uh, move into um, the part of the video where, where things are moving. Um, here you can see that we we're actually able to, um, to show the time dependence also in the, um, in the video. Again, you have these wonderful turbulent structures, which now evolve on a uh, curved surface, which are also then subject to uh, pressure gradients and, and, and these type of things. Yeah, I think these are the um, When it comes to um, kind of the more, where, where when you start to add also turbulence models, of course, you don't need to resolve all the small scales anymore. You can go into the area of large eddy simulation where only the larger scales are resolved. And of course there you can start to resolve or you can, you can treat more complicated uh, situations. Also here, I have a video which was prepared by our colleagues from, uh, from Finland. Um, and um, I don't wanna show you the whole video. I just wanna kind of show you the possibility what, is, uh, what, what can be done. In this case, they were actually looking at a highly relevant um, issue um, in today's world. And that was the spreading of uh, pollutants <clears throat> or pollutants of, of, of the air from the respiratory system. In this case, of course, motivated by uh, by uh, by the COVID um, uh, crisis that we have, and these simulations, for instance, they're now done using LES and um, and the RANS coupling, and the, the really the idea here was to make predictions on how dangerous it would be to have people with or without masks sitting in indoor spaces, and then the types of results that you can get here by just resolving the larger scales could be, for instance, results like this. When you look at how in, a, in public transportation, um, the air or the, the air flows from one seat um, to another. Of course, here one needs to keep in mind that there is a certain amount of turbulence modeling involved. It's not direct numerical simulation, but yet you can do uh, quite accurate uh, predictions. And then of course you have the RAN side, uh, which is the typical pictures that we would expect uh, to, to see from, uh, um, from CFD. Um, here I took an example from the Fluent uh, homepage where they show how, how they can model using a lot of turbulence models, so typically some K, K epsilon or K omega models uh, for the flow around a, um, uh, an aerodynamic uh, body. Of course, here you need to keep in mind again that there's a lot of modeling involved, so maybe the, the absolute accuracy of the simulation is not very high, but yet you can essentially use it quite well to make um, 
to to identify trends. You know, what happens if I change this uh, this um, this beam, or or if I if I change the angle of attack in this way, what would happen to the the, 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 the overall um, flow point? The final slide that I have about this uh, channel introduction to CFD is um, is this one here, which I would just like to to use to draw your attention to. Um, to a very interesting paper, in my view, a very interesting paper, which was um, published around five years ago by uh, NASA, and it's the CFD vision for 2030. So the idea is, what is what are the trends, what are the, um, the aspects that need to be developed for making CFD a viable um, tool in the prediction for aeronautical uh, flows in the future? And um, there is in particular this, um, this figure that, that, is, um, that is very relevant, which really gives you an overview of what types of technologies are needed, are being developed, are being improved for making CFD um, uh, really the tool of choice for, for future uh, design. And uh, without now going into, into any detail here, I think uh, there is there's a number of, of aspects more or less um, in, in the same structure that I also use today, we talk about physical modeling, we talk about algorithms, we talk about grid generation, which is also something that Adam will show later on. We talk about uh, uh, post-processing, um, but then we also kind of go, go into kind of a more um, systems uh, view of the, of, of, the whole, of the whole thing. Okay, <clears throat> with this, um, I'm now at the last slide of my CFD introduction. Um, I think the main, the main thing that I would like, would or the main thing that I liked to have um, given you uh, an idea about was that CFD is of course uh, an extremely relevant tool for uh, any types of type of research and development when it comes to fluid mechanics. But it's very expensive, which means that we really need to make sure that either we have the modeling right or we have our computer science right so that we can, we can exploit the largest computers to, to do our simulations. Um, I also like to, to, to highlight the, the aspect that I wrote here. CFD is not just engineering. It's not just taking code and, and pressing a button and running it. It's really about understanding the numerics behind it, it's understanding the physics behind it, and it's also <clears throat> understanding the computer science behind it. Only when combining these, well, three or even four aspects, if you also take the engineering into it, um, only then you can actually do uh, valuable simulations um, in, in, in CFD. And um, my, my old professor that uh, where I taught, got the CFD or learned CFD, he really called it an art rather than just uh, an engineering tool. Now, before I give, um, before we have our first break, um, I give over to, to Nicholas. I have a few slides about NEC 5000 as well, because now I've talked about CFD in general, but of course we are interested in NEC 5000. <clears throat> Now, if you go back, <clears throat> if you go back to the one of my first slides when we talked about the problems of of, um, of simulations, <clears throat> we talked about the issues of you know turbulence, about incompressibility and uh, small viscosity, boundary layers. We then realized that we need to have good codes to be able to uh, to address all these all these issues. And um, of course, there is different ways between DNS, LES, RANS, etc. And now, using NEC 5000 as our, our method, we actually uh, realized that NEC 5000 provides us with a tool, a unified tool that can mainly do DNS and LES, so direct and large eddy simulation. But it also has a um, capability of doing, at least to a, to a limited extent, um, some RAN simulations. The the, the, the very nice aspects of NEC 5000 is that it's a high order code based on the spectral element method, which Niklas will talk about uh, later on. And it has, <clears throat> it has excellent uh, scaling properties, meaning it can be run on millions of processors. And that from the computer science point of view is of course a, an important uh, aspect to keep in mind. 
<clears throat> now, when we talk about Mac 5000 as, as a code, it is an open source uh, code originally developed uh, by at MIT in the, in the 80s. And then it was a slightly adventurous history up to the point that one version of, of, of Mac 5000 was then developed by Paul Fisher, initially at the Oregon National Labs, now at, um, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And the uh, Mac 5000 has always been, or has always had a huge focus on, um, um, on uh, being an efficient code for parallel simulations. <clears throat> And as such, it has actually won a Gordon Bell Prize in 1999 for um, the algorithmic quality. The Gordon Bell Prize is one of the, the most pre prestigious prizes in computer science when it comes to high performance uh, computing. Um, one, important <clears throat> one important aspect for NEC 5000 is that actually when it comes to the actual coding, the actual implementation, um, is that it's quite straightforwardly written in Fortran 77 and C. So there is no complex object orientation in it. There's no, no, uh, abs no abstraction or anything. It is quite, quite straightforward to interact with the code. <clears throat> and there was actually a, a very simple or a, a very clear design statement behind that, and that is, that keep it simple, uh, meaning that um, the code on its own should be simple. The algorithm should not be simple, but the actual code should be simple. And this is probably something that you also see later today, that it's quite straightforward to read the code, but this is actually intentionally done in that way um, that also both humans and compilers will understand the code in a good way. NEC 5000 has a lot of features um, that many of them you will probably not use, but, but it's still good to know that you can actually extend um, any simulation that you have with, with additional things. So you can do anything from incompressible to low Mach number flows. Um, you can do um, a scalar transport. You have a conjugate heat transfer. Uh, transfer. You can even do uh, moving meshes. Combustion is possible. Um, free surfaces, etc. There's a lot of different uh, capabilities that you can do um, in in NEC 5000. And um, while while you go through through uh, through the code and the examples, you will learn more and more of the things that that can, can actually be um, done. Also important, I think, is that there's an active uh, user community behind or around NEC 5000. Here you see uh, the group picture uh, that um, that we had in. At a, a NEC 5000 users meeting, this one was in 2018 in, in Tampa in, in, in Florida, where the idea was that one would meet every two years or so and discuss the recent progress um, of uh, development and applications using NEC 5000. Now I have two more slides um, that just show some of the cases that, that one has done or people have done using NEC 5000. Here is kind of a more general overview of what can really be done with NEC 5000. So you can do flows that are relevant to the, the nuclear uh, industry. So here, for instance, is a, is a, is a rot bundle for, um, uh, for, for power plants. You can, uh, you can also do some astrophysical flows. Um, you can do, um, uh, you, you, can, you can do, um, let's say, let's see. So we have, um, uh, Combust combustion flows uh, like uh, um, like here. Um, you can have uh, ocean flows here, or you can do um, blood flow or vascular flow modeling, where you look at the kind of an intersection here um, between between two veins. All of these things are possible by just using um, one single code. Also at KTH, we have been using NEC 5000 for, for quite some time. Also here, we have used it for, for many different types of flows, pipe flows, uh, instabilities. We have looked at wind turbines. We have looked at uh, particle dispersion, heat sinks, or obstacles, these types of things. But also one, one perhaps uh, main application where we have used NEC 5000 quite extensively is for aeronautical flows, where you look at transition and turbulence on um, airfoils. 
And in this particular case, we even show the, the capability of using non-conformal adaptive meshes um, where we can uh, essentially concentrate the resolution of uh, grip points in those regions where, where we feel it's most necessary, where probably you have most turbulence um, happening, where also you need to have the best, or the, the largest number of uh, grip points. With this, um, I would like to, to stop now for my, um, my introduction, and I would like to see whether there's any questions or anything that we should um, discuss a little bit in more detail. So if you have any questions, please, um, please let me know. Um, what is the attitude to uh, MHD? Um, well, now there was a, a question in the chat. Um, oops, let's see. Uh, indeed, it's it's listed here as that, that you can also do um, MHD flows. Um, now, I'm I'm not an ex, uh, I'm not an expert on on MHD, but I guess what you do in NEC 5000 is you use the um, the Elsasser uh, formulation in which you essentially solve similar equations as the Navier-Stokes equations for the for the magnetic field, so for the B field, um, where you also have um, the um, kind of an incompressibility in some sense, and then you then you solve that, and then you couple it with a um, with a Lorentz force to the um, to the to the fluid, depending on what that, what property of the fluid. But I, um, unfortunately, I cannot say much more about that. Um, we at KTH, at least, we have never used the, the, um, the MHD type of flows. There was another uh, um, question. You mentioned FSI. Did you couple it with any open source structural code already? Um, I would say we have not done that. Um, what we at KTH have done is to couple it to kind of some simple uh, simple models of, of structural codes, but I know that at Argon uh, they have actually done some coupling between different different codes where you really have a structural a structural solver and NEC 5000 where it, where you then would, would look at um, at the FSI. For moving meshes, um, the, the the essentially the idea is uh, to use uh, the um, uh, the ALE formulation, so arbitrary Lagrangian or Eulerian formulation, where uh, the idea is that you would that you would include a uh, mesh velocity um, in into your into your solver. So you what what you can do with a with a specific um, I mean you you essentially assign a, a velocity uh, to the mesh points, which you then can use, for instance, for flapping wings or. Uh, you know, cylinders that, that have a certain pre-described um, motion. So that's that's the way you deform the mesh with a mesh velocity. That's that's the way that uh, the moving meshes are being done. There is another way um, which um, which is then uh, maybe not moving meshes in that sense, but it's overlapping meshes. So there is a there is a there is a possibility of having. Um, that you have two sessions of NAC 5000 that you solve at the same time, and then you have locally overlapping meshes where, where you can then um, communicate the, the solutions via, via, I mean, you have an explicit communicate or exchange of, uh, of between the two meshes, and then you have an iteration, an outer iteration around that to make sure that you, that you have a convergent result. Um, so that's kind of um, overlapping meshes. Of course, it comes with the cost that, that you need to uh, you need to do this uh, this iteration. That can also be used, at least to to have to to simulate um, kind of partially uh, free moving um, bodies. Uh, possible for a traveling wave, for example. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's po it's possible within within um, within a certain certain limitations. Um, there have been also some implementations of immersed boundary methods. Um, and that is, of course, not a moving flame, but that would be a moving body. But I would say there is no general uh, Im implementation of a, um, of a um, immersed boundary. When it comes to moving flames, I guess that could then be rather done with um, an adaptive mesh, where you would follow the flame in the way that you have um, 
you know, refinement around the, the, the interfaces and then de-refinement when the, when the flame has uh, passed through. That's in that sense, not a moving mesh, but uh, just an adaptive mesh. And this is something that, uh, I don't have slides now for that, but that, that's something that can be done. Okay, I guess with this, um, I would close my part um, of, of, um, of the presentation. Now, I see that we're, we're uh, slightly behind schedule already. Uh, perhaps we can have a five minute break, if that's okay. Um, so we would continue at 25 past with um, the part by, by Niklas. So that means that overall we have maybe a 10 minute uh, delay. Is that okay? Okay, but then Niklas can take over at uh, at 25 past with um, with his part. Okay, thank you very much. I will now stop the recording and turn it on afterwards again. Okay, very good. So uh, my name is Niklas Janssen, as I said, I work at PDC. So I'm gonna talk about the, the theory behind the spectral method, uh, sort of the discussion and give some hints on how this is implemented in code as well. So of course, I mean, it's not feasible for us to cover the entire spectral element method in one hour or even 45 minutes. So this would be a pure crash course. Uh, but the idea is that you should be able to uh, get some knowledge of the theory, understand why certain decisions have been made in MEC 5000 and how that affects both um, your meshing, but also most importantly, why it actually gives good performance and the good properties that we have in, in MEC 5000 as well. And this will then map to sort of the solver outline that you can then use for the hands-on session as well. Good. So uh, why high order? I mean, as Philip mentioned in the beginning, uh, that uh, we want to have uh, high order methods to get uh, very fast uh, convergence. And also we want to have a very accurate method. I mean, remember that example from the volcano with all the small turbulent scales. We want to have a method with very uh, good accuracy. I mean, it's very low, um, uh, diffusion or uh, dispersive arrows, for example. So it should be very, very uh, good at long-term integration. You don't have, we don't want to have spurious arrows for sort of causing uh, separation or, or arrows in the flow. So how can we uh, obtain this? I mean, this is sort of a contradicting uh, issue that we want to have uh, flexibility in, in our meshes. For example, we often in, in XLRAT, we're working with very engineering problems. So in biomedical engineering, we have a heart down here to, to the left. As an example, and here you want to use a sort of an unstructured mesh to represent uh, this complex shape of, of the domain. But then you're typically forced to use uh, low order methods, uh, finite elements, uh, finite volumes, for example, which might be um, an issue when it comes to uh, the numerics. And, um, but on the other hand, if you want to have very accurate methods, similar to that uh, Shannon flow that you showed from 2010, you're using uh, pure spectral methods. Uh, you have everything is based on ansatz function, uh, Chebyshev polynomials, but then you're restricted to these uh, boxes, for example. So the, the idea with spectral elements is really to combine these two uh, ideas because finite elements will decouple the geometry into a set of patches. And then you compute a solution as the contribution of all these patches. Uh, and the idea is then to each of these patches will then be sort of a spectral box. So you are globally unstructured, but locally you are this spectral regular grid. So that's sort of the idea with uh, spectral elements. So you have to reiterate again. I mean, it's, it's very suited for this uh, turbulence flow that we're targeting, fast convergence, small diffusion dispersion error, and, and also better volume over surface ratio that will actually give us very good parallel scalability that we'll see in this talk as well. Uh, and also that the spectral elements allow for very complex uh, geometries that are limiting uh, usage of these normal spectral methods. So just to uh, highlight uh, some of these properties, uh, the convergence, as said, I mean, you can reach sort of uh, exponential fast convergence for a smooth solution. Uh, an illustration is uh, Kowalski flow, where you actually get a four of magnitude reduction in arrow and doubling the resolution in all directions. Uh, and the implication of this is that you actually if you have a given error tolerance, you will actually need fewer grid points to reach that compared to low order methods, but also smaller memory footprint. 
And most, most importantly, if you want to scale this on, on a big machine, also smaller communication volume. So it's a win-win situation if you can actually exploit this for, for your problem. And also this uh, low um, diffusivity and also the dispersion error is really shown with uh, long-term integration. So this is a um, convective cone problem. It will then be convecting around the circle in, in this domain. And if you have used this problem in a typical test case for low order methods, you will see that this cone is not even close to a cone after some uh, rotations. It will be completely smeared out. But while using um, spectra elements in this case, and uh, here we have um, K elements of order N. So you see, even with very, very few elements, but with high order polynomials in each element, we can retain the shape of the cone at, at very small cost compared to very, very high um, or I should say high resolution uh, finite difference, for example, if you want to reach uh, the same uh, ID. And, and the last one, I said uh, the good for parallel computing. I mean, we're actually getting this high order at a low cost. It was true back in days, but it's even truer today because the way this is formulated is in terms of dense operators. So it has excellent vectorization properties. But also that you can exploit uh, what's called level three blasts, basically matrix matrix operations. And uh, today, this is what actually drives the, the flop rate on, on the high, biggest machines, for example, accelerators and, and so forth. Another important aspect is that uh, NEC 5000 and the spectral elements allows you to um, formulate very um, efficient preconditioners by using sort of a coarse grid uh, solver to, to solve a pressure equation. Uh, for example, think of it that you have your high order um, spectral element mesh and then you project it down to a um, finite element approximation, uh, like linear elements. Um, and of course, in all parallel computing, we need to do some kind of uh, data decomposition. And this is done by us partition these uh, quadrilateral elements that we're using, uh, like this here to the right. And these are then loosely coupled with only C0 continuity across it. That will be important uh, later on here to see that that's actually one of the ingredients that allows this to actually run up until 1 million cores, as, as Philip said. And uh, this was done on the Blue Gene Q uh, Mira, so it's several years ago. I remember 1 million uh, cores back in the days, so that, that was quite a lot. So I, I expect the recent numbers for this will actually be even higher if they run it on one of the modern machines like Fugaku that has more than 3 million cores. And also just a, a side note to Philip mentioned about um, the Gordon Bell Prize that uh, NEC 5000 won back in 99. I mean, that paper is entitled uh, Terra Scale Spectral Element Simulations. Uh, we are now leaving Petascale, moving on to Exascale. So it's also showed the age of the code as well. And it's quite interesting to see that it keeps scalability across several different generations of hardware as well, which is also important. Good. But then this sort of motivation for the high order, now we want to sort of understand how these discussions work. So then we can um, sort of use the, uh, the hello world of scientific computing, uh, the Poisson equation. So I saw from the, the, the poll that Philip had that the people are used to several different codes. Uh, you're probably used to uh, several different uh, numerical methods. So here we will try to use sort of a, a fun element way of explaining uh, spectral elements because spectral elements is sort of a subset of finite elements. So we are using a variation formulation, which basically is that we're taking our Poisson equation multiplied with uh, a test function V and we integrate by parts. And if you do that, you will see that the boundary term due to our boundary condition will just uh, disappear. So you're left with the variation problem that we will find the solution uh, in some function space V of uh, grad U grad V equals our right hand side here as well. And a way to solve this using, uh, let's say finite elements is to discretize our domain omega into a disjoint set of non-overlapping elements, as you saw in the beginning, these quadrilateral um, boxes, uh, rectangles, or you can do uh, triangles, for example, if using unstructured mesh, it doesn't matter at this point. But in order to make th this approximation, we need to find a, a function space uh, uh, Vn that will be where we're actually looking for uh, our solution. So if you're very naive, and then just say that we, we just take some simple basis function, uh, let's say uh, phi here, and then we can pick n of them, and then we get the n-dimension uh, function space. We try to find the, the solution in. 
And then we can make a very uh, simple ansatz for our solution. We are saying that u is equal to the sum of uh, some unknown psi and our basis function. And if we then uh, say that we're taking n order polynomials with equidistant points, and you would say n is equal to one, you will get this uh, classical finite element uh, with uh, hat functions that you might have seen in other courses. So um, this is still a quite easy to map to a real problem because the psi here and this phi, if you do that combination, you will actually end up with a linear system. So this is quite uh, easy to, to take in. The question is then, we aim for high order. Are there any restriction on how large this, this n can be and, and still be usable? So now we are going into sort of basic uh, numeric analysis. Let's say that we want to um, interpolate uh, to represent this uh, function here. And let's say that we're taking a 10th order polynomial to, to represent it, meaning that we, we want to use a 10th order um, function space in our uh, approximation, then I hope you, you know that you will, uh, this will not go well because you'll end up with these horrible uh, errors due to Runge's phenomena that you get this oscillation at the endpoints, for example, which means that it will not be uh, so stable for very large numbers of n, which means that the traditional equidistant uh, points in our function space is not going to fly if you want to do sort of traditional finite elements with a very large number of n here, very high order. So we have to do something else. And here we enter sort of the, the, the good decisions uh, when designing the spectral elements is that we want to choose a different basis. And why is why are we getting Runge's phenomena here? And I hope you know that it's actually due to the equidistant points here that will cause uh, these oscillation due to how you enforce um, the derivatives in, inside this interpolation. So the solution is actually to change both the polynomial and uh, the points where you evaluated in. So using this uh, Legendre polynomials, and the key here is actually to use this gauss robot Legendre quality points. And you see here on the element in the middle, they're actually not equidistant anymore. They're actually spread out in, in, this, in this way. And this will avoid this issue from this phenomenon that we saw before, that we actually can uh, represent a solution of this element without these uh, spurious oscillations. And we see here, uh, the other figures here are an example of these uh, shape functions, uh, um, these polynomials on, on, on this uh, 2D element as well. And the second thing, we had this answers before, the other one that actually is one of the uh, key decisions inside uh, the spectral elements is that you want to use a tensor product polynomials as the answers function. Instead of just having the simple phi function, we uh, take the entire Lagrangian polynomial here and have this tensor product formulation to actually represent everything. Uh, and if you have seen finite elements before, you know that some part of, the, of this ansatz will be the uh, matrix entries, and that's actually this uh, H terms here, so that's A, I, J. And if you, if you work out the math, you will see that you actually end up with a linear system, A, U equals F that you want to solve. So traditionally, you then have to uh, construct uh, your global matrix by looping over all your element, uh, so each element K in the, in the mesh T. So then you do all the combinations of different uh, basis functions. You compute an element stiffness matrix, AK, basically computing the variation of form on that uh, small patch you saw on, on the previous uh, slide, and add that contribution into the global matrix. And I and J here is sort of a local numbering on that element. And capital I, I and capital I, J are mapping functions from the local numbering to the global numbering such that they end up on the same place uh, in, um, in the big matrix. So for example, you might have elements, of course, elements will share points. So this term here will then make sure that you get all the contributions from all the neighbors when you assemble uh, the big system uh, as finite element is supposed to work. So if you do this for, for a first order linear elements, we'll end up in, in a sparse matrix that you can solve. So that is, uh, you can run quite large uh, meshes with that because it's uh, very compact in memory but it's very slow to compute it because you have very uh, sparse non-continuous um, data, which is very bad for current machines. So the question is, can we, can we really do this uh, with our answers function? Because the sparse system, uh, these small matrices are basically three times three or nine times nine, for example, if you do it with, with linear elements, but how big will it be with, with our answers? 
And if you work out with, with the tensor products in 2D, you will see it actually be n to the four non-zeros or n to the six uh, in 3D. So we're getting dense blocks that are then added into the matrix. So if you're running a simulation with let's say 1 million elements, um, that would be a lot of dense information in that uh, matrix, so it's not so sparse anymore. So clearly this is not really feasible anymore to form A and we have to do something else. And this is again leading them into the key decision in the design of NEC 5000 and, and SEM. So instead, uh, let's say that we are uh, assuming a lot of things that we, own, we don't want to assemble matrix L, we work with the unassembled matrix AL, which basically takes all these um, elements difference matrices, put them on the diagonal like that. And if you remember uh, the element, the element has a lot of points, they are shared. So also this UL would then contain uh, replicated data, basically, like that, the, the shared points. And um, so now one can start to think, is this actually uh, helping us in any way? Can we, can we use this in a, in a way to solve our systems? Because we want to solve AU equals F to get our solution to Poisson problem. Uh, so we probably need basically what's, what's in here in the off diagonal terms uh, uh, when you assemble the matrix are these connections to the, to the shared elements, which we're not getting now. And also you might need the entire matrix to actually do your, your solvers, your, your factorizations, for example. But um, we actually don't need the entire matrix um, to solve it if you use a, a good uh, solver. We actually only need the action A times U inside uh, ITRAS till solvers. And you can think about why, and we will end up in, in sort of showing it why it works at towards the end of this presentation, but saying that we can only use the matrix vector product, which will really get a, mate, a vector, we will not get a matrix anymore. If you have a solver that can handle this, we can then start to reformulate the way we actually uh, computing this such that we can use the unassembled matrix here. So that's good. Then we can avoid uh, constructing uh, the very large matrix uh, A, which is unfeasible, but we can still start to reason about if we can actually afford to compute these um, element matrices, because remember they are, they are quite large. Uh, and then you can um, uh, argue with yourself, uh, there are two costs here, of course. I mean, one is, uh, can I afford it memory-wise? Can I keep them in memory because they are dense? Uh, can I afford to do it uh, compute-wise? And then you can think what I said in the beginning that uh, compute is basically for free nowadays. Uh, memory is sort of the, the expensive part uh, of a computation. So, um, and how to handle this is of course, we don't want to compute the element matrices. And the way this is done is because um, we use what's called a matrix free operator evaluation. So we remember the Poisson element stiffness matrix is basically that we take the integrals over the element and then we do grad U, grad V, uh, uh, D, and we have these tensor product polynomials with the shape function you see to the right there. And if we want to compute uh, this element stiffness matrix, we need to be able to do uh, partial uh, derivatives. And now I see the PowerPoint messed up the slides. One should never do final minute adjustments, but uh, never mind. Uh, so the, the partial derivatives here, if you actually take this tensor product polynomials and then you do du dr, for example, and if you work this out, since you are basing this on tensor products, you will see that the derivative will actually be a matrix matrix product. So this part here is actually a matrix matrix product. It's small, but it's a matrix matrix product. And every time you look in, in NEC, you will see something called MXM, and this is this small matrix matrix products. And this has uh, always been the case that doing matrix matrix is much faster than matrix vector, for example. And just again, to get some connection to, to modern hardware, uh, for example, uh, GPUs today has a lot of what's called tensor cores. And this of, is of course, uh, small matrix matrix uh, products uh, due to, uh, to the machine learning community. So uh, again, I mean, we are getting more and more aligned to, to the hardware development here as well. It's perfect uh, idea. Uh, good, so anyway, I mean, so we have a fast way of computing our uh, partial derivatives. Uh, let's say we call them D. So that we could actually then pre-compute D for all uh, our directions, X, Y, Z in, in 3D or X, Y in, in, in um, 2D. 
then we can uh, sort of stash them in a matrix on the diagonal and we can perform the entire uh, partial derivative evaluation by just a matrix vector multiplication. So now uh, people might be, be wondering, uh, is this really valid? Uh, don't you have a different uh, derivative uh, for all the different uh, elements in a mesh if it has a different shape and, and very nice uh, box? And yes, that is of course true. And this is one of uh, the key aspects of both finite elements, uh, how we actually do this in a good way. Because you don't want to have separate routines for all the different deformations of uh, meshes. What we want to have is a, a, what's called a reference element. And we want to make all the actual computations on this reference element here. So we need to find some kind of mapping moving from our physical space on uh, to the reference element where we do the actual computations. So we, we assume that we have this invertible map from physical domain to uh, the reference domain. And how to actually move all these coordinates, but I mean, they actually comes in sort of the same way as doing this tensor product as, as solutions. So it uses the same um, shape functions here as well. Uh, we can use the partial derivatives that we sort of shown how to do it in the, in the previous uh, slide. And then you can just uh, go crazy with, with the chain rule. And then you will actually get the expression of actually how to evaluate the u uh, dx on, on, the, on uh, the reference and the physical element as well. And um, if you then work out your uh, variation formulation, you will get this term, uh, du, dr, dr, dx, uh, dv, dr, dr, dx, for example, for the, the test and trial function. And then you can start rearranging terms and you suddenly you will end up with a lot of uh, DRI and DXK terms and you can group all of them together. And this is what we call uh, the geometric factors, uh, G. So every time you see uh, a matrix called uh, G inside um, NEC, it is related to this uh, mapping between reference and physical domain and vice versa. And of course, then you also this also includes a Jacobian here that comes uh, from the mapping in, in itself. So um, yes, a quick pause here. I mean, now we have seen how to actually avoid uh, assembly matrix. We can, we can, we don't even have to assemble uh, the element matrices. We can do that with tensor products. We can then uh, form these geometric factors again with sort of just uh, tensor products. And we can uh, move between the different uh, nice reference element to the physical way and back to do this easy evaluations. So, but before we actually continue, because we're doing this mapping, it, it's very important to keep in mind that um, even if you do your mesh, you have uh, sort of uh, deformed elements, these will then be mapped to a nice regular reference element for computation. But that will of course not help you if your elements are very, very deformed. Uh, very skewed, for example, that would be very bad when then do the mapping to the reference element. So the mapping will not uh, make this more stable. And if you have used uh, low order finite elements, for example, you, you know that this is a big issue, sort of the shape, what's called the mesh quality of the elements. But then you can get away with quite bad elements because then you only usually have uh, points, degrees of freedom here in the, in the corners, you might have one in, in the middle, but now since we have all these uh, GLL points spread across the entire elements, the effect will be even worse if you have a very squeezed element and then do this, this mapping. So really try to avoid these high ratio cells if possible when you do your meshing as well. So uh, another uh, advice as well is of course, now I haven't told said, said anything about this explicitly, but we are using quadrilateral or hex elements and we don't allow any uh, hanging nodes. So basically, um, I mean, we are a conformal method here. We don't allow to have a degree of freedom here from element 14. So everything has to be continuous. You cannot have degrees of freedom that are alone on a face, for example. And of course, if you want to have then high resolution here in the middle, we will get this side effect of very long, uh, high aspect ratio uh, elements in the far field. So, so meshing is a, uh, an issue. Uh, there are ways around it using non-conform elements, uh, and there you really have Adam is the expert uh, guy to go to in, in this group for that. So that was a side note on sort of the meshing. We will hear more about meshing this afternoon. 
But just to then recap then that we have our um, elements difference matrix, we can then approximate it by the multiplication of uh, the derivative times the test function, our geometric factors, and then the derivative, our, again, our, our trial function. We can rework this a bit. We can split things out. And we see in the end that we end up with um, uh, the test functions and then the detransposed geometric factors and the derivative again, or the gradients, I should say. Which means that we can sort of express the entire bilinear form of Poisson um, using this expression so that we have our variation formulation, the bilinear form in this case. And now we assume that the right hand side is to form. Uh, which is the sum over all the elements. So we have um, our um, sort of the trial or test function on, on that element. The derivative here, it will be the same on all elements because again, we do this mapping to reference element, right? So you can pre-compute D that will be a small uh, matrix that you can actually store. Uh, the geometric factors of course will be unique per element. So that will be a big field for all the elements. So you have to have a unique one and then of course we just have the other derivative here and then uh, down on u. And simplify it even more, d, t, g, d, that will be what is called uh, the element matrix here again. So uh, we are getting closer and closer to what sort of a, a formulation that is similar to if people have seen a finite element before. But before we actually take the last step, just a recap here is that we use uh, chain rule and the good quality points here that will allow us to do matrix-free operator evaluation. Everything is based on tensor products. We don't form any of the matrices. Uh, and the operation count, if you actually do the, this uh, in, in 3D now, will be n to the power of four in 3D and not n to the power of six. And that is um, achieved by using uh, some nice uh, properties that you can actually play around with these derivative uh, matrices by multiplying with uh, the identity like this. And, and this is the, the tricks from Orisag back in, in, back in the eighties. Um, and uh, memory access is not so, so uh, high either. So you get a good byte per flop ratio here actually when you do the computation. And the, the work is really dominated by these matrix matrix products involving the derivatives and so forth. So if you do sort of a profiling of NEC 5000, you often see MXM showing up, MXM as a number, because they are not only square, they might be rectangular, for example. So everything is boiling down to a small matrix matrix products. But we have one more thing to actually solve. So now we have this sum over all these element matrices. But remember in the beginning that we, um, had uh, only elements on the, on the diagonal, and I said we sort of uh, removed all these connections to the neighboring elements. And we also have data replication in, in uh, UL because we have our normal domain uh, omega. And of course, when we split it into element matrices, this, for example, this middle point U6 here will be replicated in two places here U12 and U201, for example, these two ones. That, that should have the same value, of course, because we want to ensure. Uh, C0 uh, continuity here. We don't want to commit any variational crime using DG. And the way this is done uh, in NEC is that we are using a, a Boolean gather matrix and a scatter matrix. Uh, the gather is uh, Q transpose and the scatter is uh, Q. So basically it's zeros and one. And if you rearrange uh, the, the ones in certain places, when you multiply your UL with Q, these two points here will then become uh, the same num number. They will, for example, be added together. Uh, so this is our map from local uh, to global space and back to ensure this continuity. So if you have the bilinear formulation, we have our sum, sum of all the element matrices. We can then hit it with this uh, Boolean gather matrices and the scatter matrices. And if you work this out, you will see that we'll end up with a normal A that is representing the entire problem. So now uh, people might then wonder, I have been always saying that we cannot even form A, but can we then afford, uh, afford to form uh, Q? But of course, no, we, we cannot afford to form Q. Anything that is above uh, the element uh, matrix, uh, we cannot form. But again, we don't need Q, uh, Q, T, 
explicitly, we only need uh, the action Q, Q transposed. Because remember when I talked about the matrix tree formulation, we only needed the action A times U. And of course, then if, if we only need the action Q, Q transposed, that is, has a connection to that as well. Because if you have the global V is equal A times U, that can then be written in uh, the matrix tree way as uh, W unassemble, which has this replicated data. Multiply with Q, Q transpose, and then AL, which is this unassembled matrix, and the unassembled uh, vector U, for example. And this will make sure that Q, Q transpose will then ensure that you get the same values in V, L that you will get in, in V here. And how this is done, that this is a combined uh, gather scatter operation. So what you see on, on the code block down uh, to the right is when you do the first uh, gather step, you're basically looping over all the elements and all the basis function. You take a mapping from these points uh, from the local number to the global number up here. And you keep, uh, you accumulate them in some vector that is indexed by, uh, for example, the global number. And later when you do the, the scatter step, you do the reverse, you loop over all the elements, you see which uh, global number it corresponds to, and then you fetch this accumulated value uh, into your local representation. So basically we're going from this one up to the one that is connected and then spread it out again to uh, these domain. And this is what allows us to actually only work on the local uh, level, this element level. So we only have to concern about physics on this level, not on the global level. And Q can, Q, Q, QT will be our gather uh, scatter operation that keeps everything uh, nice and coherent on the global sense. And one very important thing that is often overlooked is that if you have worked, for example, with high order uh, finite different methods, you often have very wide stencils. Let's say you have five points in each direction. And if you have a multi-block approach, for example, these stencils will then expand into the neighboring blocks. So you have to keep a lot of halo points that you need to keep up to date. But uh, with this uh, formulation in NEC, we have on, always unit depth stencil that we need to communicate, only one point, independent of uh, the order we're using. So we can run order 42 if that would be numerical stable, and we only have to communicate uh, one point, namely uh, the shared point here as well. So, um, that is uh, how everything fits together in uh, spectral elements, sort of the, the crash course of it. Of course, in the end, we need to also to solve uh, a system. So we really need uh, scalable linear solvers. Uh, and the key considerations here when you're picking it is that you want to have bound on the iteration count as your polynomial order goes to, let's say, infinity. Uh, and of course, it should not change uh, the properties when you increase the number of processes either. So what we are using is uh, Krylo methods, uh, conjugate gradient, and for example, GMRS methods that are preconditional with uh, multi-level additive uh, Swartz method. And we see we have uh, CG or GMRS that are Krylo methods. And if you remember from New York analysis courses, Krylo methods are based on multiplication of A times U. So you never have to have the entire matrix A when you're using this iterative method. You only need the action A times U. And that connects back to what I said with the matrix tree formulation. And you also see here in the CG formulation that I had here on the, on the right hand, on line 10, we have the usual uh, matrix times vector, but now that is replaced then with this uh, gather scatter times unassembled matrix. So this is sort of why it's okay for us to actually use this unassembled matrix inside our uh, solvers. Uh, and this Schwartz thing in the end, we had this coarse grid solver that said is basically a low order approximation. And that can be solved either using uh, direct methods. And now since it's, it's a, a lower order, you can afford to, to build it. Or we can use a single uh, V cycle of uh, algebraic multigrid. And this also connects up to the, the first observation. I mean, we know that AMG is uh, asymptotically optimal. So it will convert in the same number of iterations independent of the matrix size. So that's an excellent choice if you want to run very large problems with high um, high order. And the last thing that we will not talk about uh, in this presentation, but NEC is also using a projection time 
to uh, exploit temporary regularity. For example, the pressure might not change so much between uh, different situations. And then we can use projection to actually find a good guess, uh, initial guess for the next uh, iteration, the time step, I mean, when we solve it. Uh, and then the final thing with the with this flow solvers that we will see uh, from Adam, uh, we have this time stepping in, in NEC, and we have split it such that uh, the non gluon term is using an sort of an explicit method, is Kate order backward uh, difference formula with uh, extrapolation. And uh, the Stokes problem is solved for using uh, three Helmholtz solves for the velocity. And then of course, a Poisson equation for the pressure that also Philip hinted is, is the most terrible thing. Uh, I thought you was about to say root of all evil, but it's a root of all turbulence, but it's certainly the root of all evil when you're doing uh, numerical simulations. And then finally, just to see how this is implemented sort of on a high level in the code, we basically write everything as this Helmholtz problem, um, H of uh, phi, and then you have two uh, scalars, H1 and H2, and A is difference matrix and B is the mass matrix. And then if you want to solve for uh, the velocity, you basically pick H1 to one and H2 to B0 um, divided by uh, the time stepping that comes from this uh, extrapolation terms. Uh, and likewise, if you want to solve for the pressure, you just set H1 to one and H2 to zero, and then you will up with the normal uh, pressure Poisson problem. So you can be expressed in a quite general way inside uh, the code uh, as well. Going back to that uh, simplicity that, that Philip talked about in uh, the lecture. So that is actually at the end of the presentation, a bit rushed, but uh, we run, um, came, gained some uh, time that, that lost before. So let's see, we have some uh, questions in the chat, if I can um, see where we started with that. No, okay, I see that Philip has uh, answered most of them. Uh, if there are any more questions, please, uh, write them in the chat. So when I upload the next one to the, the latest version of the slides to the homepage, I will also add some uh, links to um, Paul's book, for example, some literature references, because it's a bit too much to actually expect people to understand the spectral elements in, in one hour. Good. So that was the end of it. Okay. I guess if there is <clears throat> if there's no questions, or I mean you can think of the questions uh, also during the break, but I guess that we can have a break for um, 15 minutes and then at 11 15 um, Adam would um, show how to install like. So let's let's have a break now until a quarter past, but feel free to um, to post some questions or comments and um, I guess whatever we have fetched our coffees, we will start to discuss. Okay, I will stop the recording if I find the button. Um, uh, okay, so uh, now we go to more practical part of the whole talk and uh, Coming back to the two questions which were uh, show, shown on chat, one was about the polynomial order, and exactly as Philip wrote, the higher polynomial order, the, the better, but of course there is as well a drawback. You have to remember we don't use uh, the uniform distribution of the points, and actually with our polynomial orders, the dis distance of the two points closest to the uh, to the border, external border of the element, goes down with the square of polynomial order. So it, it really goes quickly down. And that, of course, limits our uh, CF, uh, CFD number, let's say CFL. That means that the time step cannot be uh, too large. And of course, there is some, you, you have to find a sweet spot between the uh, how fast you converge and how short your time step is. Uh, the other question was about the drawbacks, and Niklas pointed out a very important uh, problem, which is, of course, meshing for NEC because everything is hex based meshing. And the other, let's say, constraint which you have to take into account is, for example, that everything is C0 continuous at the element borders. And that actually means that 
the solution itself is continuous, but the derivative is not. So if you look into some variables that are dependent on the velocity or pressure derivatives, then you can see this continuity. And that of course depends once again, a lot on the resolution you have. By increasing resolution, you correct those problems. But uh, we could see in, in our past that when you go, for example, into the uh, turbulent statistics for some given resolution, you can see some kinks at the element borders between them. So that's like an additional comment to this. Uh, I would like as well to remind you that you can find all of the presentations on the uh, course webpage. So you see all those, those links here. And I would like uh, to ask you to download for the hands-on session, uh, the example code, which is available on the, uh, on the uh, course webpage. Uh, as well to download from the original NEC webpage, the NEC version 19 TAR file. So before, uh, before we start the, the hands-on session after lunch, we'll be ready to have all of the code uh, directly. So now let's go to the presentation. And here I should start with some uh, disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is very introductory. So if somebody, has already used NEC and if used quite a lot, then this can be too simple. But actually we had to start somewhere and in, in the beginning it's, it's hard to know what the audience is. And actually it's, right now it looks like it's 50-50 more or less that some part of, of, uh, of you have already used NEC. For some it, it's completely new code. So this is very introductory. And I try to go from all of the steps from the beginning what to do to start to work with the code. So I will talk shortly about the resources where you can find the code, where to find the documentation, how to get the help, as well about what is the structure of the code, how to set up the case. So going first, we of course have to get the code. And to get the code, you have two options. One is the, the tarball, and actually that's the most uh, reasonable way of taking the code. Uh, the other is the GitHub source. However, there, you have to be aware of the fact there is no development branch in the GitHub, uh, GitHub uh, repository. So all of the development goes uh, directly to the master. So using uh, the, the code from the GitHub repository is a little bit like leaving on the, uh, on the uh, bleeding edge it's probably safer to use just a tar file until, until, unless you simply need some specific feature that was lately uh, developed. So the web page actually is the, the, the main source of, of, of the code. Then you have, of course, documentation. You have the GitHub repository, which I mentioned. And of course, the nicer part is the gallery. So you can see how many different applications of NEC and how none of, some of them are really complex, like for example, this, this piston engine uh, simulation. And uh, I will not show those, those uh, movies here, but you can go there, you can see that actually there are plenty of different application of those code. And some of them are really complex and actually interesting. So when it comes to the, to the uh, help, uh, there is a mailing list, actually it's a Google group where you can directly ask questions and most of those questions are, are uh, answered relatively quickly. Of course, it depends how complex the, the, the question is, but there is as well an archive where you can go through the code, uh, you, you go through the previous question, go to the issues which people found earlier uh, and get help. When it comes to the uh, sharing the code, uh, of course, there is the Git repository, uh, plus some, there are some additional uh, places uh, where one can have a, the third party source, like for example, our KTH uh, Git repository, which we, I will describe later on. So when it's come to the documentation, it's uh, pretty nice. It's not very detailed when it comes to the theory, but you have that basic information Actually, I think that the, the presentation which Niklas gave is only going a little bit beyond this, this theory 
description, which is on the documentation webpage. But anyhow, it's a good starting point for learning what can NAC, what is the, the, the idea behind it, and what is uh, the algorithm of the code. Of course, you have as well there the quick start part, which is once again, very good. I will go very briefly th through some information which is uh, involved in this, this, this quick start part during this, this presentation, but you can actually find a way more uh, in this documentation set. So I would uh, suggest you to go there later on if you would like to go really and work with NEC more. Uh, there are some as well tutorials. There are actually three of them right now, and they are quite nice because they actually uh, start from the very basic uh, examples. One of them is this periodic heel case, which we actually will mention as well during the one of the, our hands-on session. They show different capabilities and, and possibilities of, of running NAC. Some of them rather simple, some of them more complex, like for example, the next, uh, this, this periodic heel, which in this case is uh, overlapping uh, meshes. It's something what uh, Philip mentioned during his talk that you can have two different meshes and they can actually move with respect to each other and everything is fine as long as they overlap and you can have this Hymera mesh cases and you with this tutorial this this this, uh, this uh, quick start start uh, uh, you can find step by step what to do how to run a given case uh, we will not go through them I did prepare slightly different a test case for, for going through step-by-step step how to compile, how to run and prepare the case. But you can go back to those as well and look to, at them later on. So uh, the important, of course, information is how, what are different boundary conditions? What are uh, different parts of the session? What kinds of, what uh, different parameters you can use? And you have those, those problems set up section here, which allows you to tell, uh, to describe more about what are the required parameters, what are the, the routines. I will describe them, those minimum set of, of the information which is required to run, I will give today. However, there is more information which you can find uh, in this problem setup section. And of course, appendixes. Uh, once again, important to go there, because I will not be able to cover here uh, all of those aspects, like the, the pre-processing clicks, I will mention them. Uh, but there is here one important issue with the documentation. Unfortunately, you see this number here, that it's NEC 17. Uh, this documentation is a little bit outdated uh, because right now I will talk about NEC 19. So it's a next release. There are some, some, some problems, but those are actually, I will mention where the differences are. So there are a few more options in uh, version 18, uh, some few small mod modifications with respect to version 17. Some of those I will cover here, uh, but of course not all of them because it's, there are simply too many of them. So uh, when it comes to, to the GitHub repository, as you can see, there's a few repositories which are pinned on the, on the beginning, you have the NEC 5000, which is the most interesting to us. However, once again, there is no development branch. Everything goes directly to the master branch. Uh, by the way, is my mouse visible or? Okay, I hope. Yes, your, your, your mouse is visible, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, then you have uh, additional important repositories, like for example, GSLeap, which is exactly the library that performs this QQT operator, which, which uh, uh, Nicholas was talking about. This is this scatter scatter code, uh, which we, we have. Then you have some, some uh, part partitioning code and NECRS. Uh, so maybe we should mention here that NEC 5000 has a long history. And now there are a few attempts in Europe and in US quite separate uh, to make a new version of NEC, uh, so, so to, to simply rebuild the code. And NECRS is one of those attempts. Attempts, And actually, I will not talk about this because it's, it's different, a little bit different kind of code 
if you would like to be interested in those new versions, uh, then you will have to look on, on, on their own because this, this presentation will not cover them. There are a few more repositories which are uh, interested in NEC. Of course, one of those is, is this NEC 5000 repository, which you can find. Uh, the other one is NEC examples. Uh, actually, NEC examples are a separate repository on the Git, but they are part of the tarball. So when you take the tarball from the uh, web page, you will get all of those NIC examples. And actually those examples are the best source of information you can get about how to run NEC and how to extend your knowledge because they cover actually almost all different possible usage of NEC uh, with the moving meshes and so on. I will come back to this later on uh, during our uh, hands-on session. The other uh, interesting repository you can find there is something which is called NEC MATLAB. And this is a good repository if you would like to learn more about spectral element method and would like to learn about what the al real algorithm is, because this one contains number of MATLAB scripts, which uh, Paul Fisher created for one of his uh, lectures on uh, SEM and NEC 5000. And this is actually a good starting point if you would like to learn what all this matrix, matrix multiplication, QQT, what really all those parts mean. Of course, for us, the most important part is the code itself. So what is the structure of the code? If you would download the tarball, you will see that there are actually a few different subdirectories. Uh, the most important, of course, is the core. That's where the whole NEC 5000 code is located. Then you have a bean where you have a number of tools and a number of, of scripts that are useful to, to or necessary to, to use during the uh, NEC use. Then you have as well standalone tools, which you, you have to compile in the beginning of, of, your, uh, of running NEC. And this tool directory contains the source code of them. After compilation, they will be located under bin. Then you have a short test, which are not very important for us. Those are the short tests, which are uh, run after every commit to the Git repository to see the consistency and correctness of the result. Then you have the always empty subdirectory run, which is supposed to be used by the user to, to, to compile their setups. And then, of course, you have the examples, which I already mentioned. Uh, that's it's that's you know the, the mine of the knowledge about NEC, how to use it. And then you have that third part libraries. That means this this QQT operator, GSLib, uh, Parmetis, partition, other partitioning libraries, or, or BLAST libraries. All this stuff is contained here. In general, the assumption is that you don't need anything more than just a tarball from the web page to run NEC because whatever additional library required by NEC uh, has to be added, all this stuff should be inside this third party stuff. So the assumption of NEC is that all it's, it's self-included. There is no additional code which would be necessary to run. So what are the, the most important scripts and most important tools which are shipped together with the, with NEC code. And uh, the tools like the, those meshing tools, you will have to compile to yourself under the uh, tools directory. Uh, and then all of them will be at the end copied and available under Bean. So one of the uh, important scripts, which we'll talk later on is a make -net script which actually is a compilation script. It's a bash script, which allows you to perform the compilation of all of the required third-party tools and the NEC code as, uh, as well. Uh, the other important tools can be all this NEC MPI or NEC DMPI, because those are the, the, the scripts that allow us to run the code. And then the, the, code, the script which you will be uh, using, it will be this VisNEC, because after running, you need a metadata file that can be opened by visit or paraview, and then you can visualize your data. So MakeNEC is for compilation, NECMPI or NECBMPI are for the running the code, and 
uh, VSTAC is, is for generating the, the metadata file for visualization. There is as well this NECNEC script, which allows you to run two different instances of, of NEC for the Hymera mesh cases, but we will not cover this here, so we will leave it. Uh, there is, of course, a, a number of tools which we should mention. There is a set of tools to generate a mesh. Some of them, like Genbox, NECMERGE, or PreTech, PREX, uh, those are the, the, the uh, internal NEC tools to generate the meshes. Uh, we will not use them in our case, maybe except Genbox for, for one of the, of the cases. Uh, but we will rather consider the other option. That means running the other meshing tool and then converting the, the existing mesh to the NEC format. And actually there are a few different converters added to, to NEC. This is exo to NEC, CG, CGNS to NEC, and GMesh to NEC. We will actually work with the latest one. And that is why I hope that, that all of you have installed GMesh or at least have GMesh. Uh, because one of the test cases will actually, uh, of our examples will be based on GMesh Mesh. Uh, there are as well additional tools, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, which are required for producing all of the, uh, all of the files necessary for, for the running NEC 5000. Because actually NEC 5000 requires a set of files one of those is the mesh description, but unfortunately in, in the case of the file containing the mesh description, there is no connectivity information. And that is why this connectivity information uh, has to be generated in the pre-processing step. And that is why you have those two tools. One is gen, called GenCon, the other is called GenMap. They do kind of similar work, that means they include the missing part of the information about uh, the, the connectivity of different elements, vertices, uh, and so on, based on the mesh file, which is the, the, the mesh produced for NEC. Uh, the difference between this GenCon and GenMap is that GenCon is used only for producing the connectivity information. However, GenMap provides two kinds of information, connectivity between elements and as well the, the partitioning information. That means when you run GenMap, you first generate the information about the, how different elements are connected. And then as well, you perform pre, in the pre-step the, the, the global ordering of the elements and the partitioning at the same time. So in the case on, of GenMap, you don't need the, the uh, partitioning tool to be used during the NEC 5000 run. In the case of GenCon, you have to perform the dynamic partitioning during the run. In our case, we will not talk about this uh, dynamical partitioning during the run, we skip it. We only will run GenMap. So what we will be actually interested in is uh, GMesh to NEC for converting the mesh from GMesh format to NEC format. In one of the case, it will be GenBox, and as well, GenMap tool. So those are the, the, the cases which are uh, which would be interested in. So now let's go to the compilation of the code. How the compilation works, what is required, and how to actually, uh, how to feed the, the compilation script, which is the, uh, the make NAC with the information. So the information, uh, the MakeNAC actually is a bash, simple bash script that only gathers the, 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 uh, the environment variables. That's what you have to do. You have to export environment uh, variables to, for, for MakeNAC. So those are, the, are, are generated. Then, then the netconfig script is called. However, netconfig what it does, it only checks if the, if the variables have changed and then goes directly to makenec.inc. So that's what, what it does. First, we collect all of the environment variables. Then we simply call netconfig, but directly going to makenec.inc. And then we simply 
execute make and we compile the code. Uh, because make, and actually uh, there is a number of variables you have to export uh, before, before you call make. make. So, so the, the list of the uh, variables can be of course found on the uh, documentation webpage. Uh, the most important ones is the Fortran compiler, C compiler, compilation flags, and of course, the position where you find your, your source code. Uh, you have as well additional uh, PP list variable, which allows you to turn on different features of Mac, which are actually given by the pre-processing flags. And those pre-processing flags you can as well find on the documentation. Uh, there is, unfortunately, in this case, there is a little bit this, this uh, part of the page is a little bit outdated. The something what was previously called source root right now is called source underscore uh, NEC source root. And as well, because NEC V17 and NIC V19 have different uh, uh, features when it comes to, to the uh, dynamic partitioning, uh, blast or hyper, then the list of the pre-processing flags will change. However, we will not actually go in any of those features because this is kind of more complex stuff. So we can leave this PP list variable for now. So what we will be actually using from those, it will be of course, FC and CC, next source root and user. User is a variable which allows you to add to the compilation script an additional set of uh, uh, files who you would like to 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 compile neck with and to do this and you know this is an example okay i'm sorry uh, the example of how uh, how how you can actually build the the script because make neck is actually part of the source code and it's located under bean so what i usually prefer and what i do myself i create a simple bash script uh, which uh, will be, uh, which is located in the source code of my setup, of my given setup. It's separate from the next source code. And in this uh, script, I simply give export all of the variables required. That means next source root, that means where actually my neck code is located, what compilers I'm using, what preprocessing list is, is used. You see this actually is, is empty but as well, what kind of additional files I would like to, to compile with NEC. Because actually one of the important features of NEC is that it's pretty flexible. It allows you to interact with it. And of course, then you need to compile additional code. To do this, you specify all of the additional uh, routines, the additional files, not routines, I'm sorry, uh, inside the user variable. And then what you do, you prepare a file called make file underscore user dot ink. And this file is simply a simple make file, uh, make file uh, that contains the, the rules, the make rules for each of the files uh, you are going to compile. And here what we have is actually an example of one of our framework make files, actually maybe a little, a little bit older version and a script which I'm using uh, we developed and, and we think it's, it's useful for actually compilation of every given uh, setup. And both the script and the uh, example of the make file you will find in or in our framework stuff or in our example. This, this script actually is involved, uh, is included in the example which I will talk during the first hands on session. So, what part of, of the uh, because that was part about the, the, the compilation. What are the different files you have to prepare when you want to create a new case? The first file you need is a size file. And that size file contains all of the information about the, the parameters, uh, array sizes, polynomial orders, and so on. All of the, those information has to be given in advance because NEC 5000 is 477 code. So it means static allocation uh, and everything has to be done, uh, given all the information has to be given before the compilation. 
And the other uh, file you have to prepare is the case name, whatever you would it be, underscore user. The user file contains a set of subroutines which are intended to be an interface between a user and the net code. That's a set of routines, which we actually, we, I will talk about this in a while, uh, contains the boundary conditions, uh, give you a possibility to, to interact with the code after every step. This is a, the, the stuff which you have to provide for compilation, size file and user file. The rest of those files which are mentioned here are for the running the case. That means runtime parameter, mesh description, and this is this RE2 file. This is a binary file uh, which contains the mesh information and as well MA2 file, which is produced by GenMap. And it contains based on the RE2 connectivity information plus partitioning information. And then of course you have the possibility to have some additional stuff like for example, history points, if you would like to locate somewhere inside the mesh a probe and you know with some given frequency uh, to get the information, what is the velocity and pressure or whatever fields you define value here, then you can define a history points which are located somewhere in the, in the domain. And the output would be the history points. It will be appended by the additional information. What was the word for those values? or the plot files, uh, which are ending with .f and the number. The additional uh, file like this case name .nec5000, this is actually produced, file produced by vSNEC. This is a metadata file, which allows you to visualize your, your uh, plot field, the field plots, this .f files in visit of Paraview. And I'm mentioning here, and I will, talk a few words about uh, legacy runtime parameter map uh, and mesh description RIA and map files. Those two are not maybe interesting for, for the future uh, user because they are replaced by PAR, RE2 and MA2. You see there are three of them. Previously there were only two of them uh, because RIA file was containing both runtime parameters and as well uh, the, the, the mesh description. However, in the examples you will see them, so, so I will mention them as well. However, those are not the recommended right now uh, way of, of uh, running the, the, the next case. So going back to all those parts which I, I mentioned, for compilation, you have to provide size file. And that's a template of the size file, which simply contains the information, what the, what's the dimension of your mesh? Uh, what's the, actually it's not a polynomial order, it's a polynomial order plus one, meaning it's, it's the number of grid points inside the uh, single element in every direction. So, so the number of points inside a single element will be LX1 cubed or in 3D or LX1 square in, in 2D, as well like, like uh, additional information like, like how many elements globally you have. Uh, the important actually parameter which is here is this LELT because something what we haven't talked yet and, and Niklas to some extent he mentioned that, that we talk about a parallel execution of the code. So you have to distinguish two things. One is the global element of, ma of uh, number of elements inside the whole run and a local number of elements, which is here this LELT given. And uh, you have to be aware of the fact that you have like two different kinds of mapping. You have a global mapping of your elements where you try to number globally, provide to every element a global unique number, but each of the uh, processors, MPI runs, will actually have only a small subset of those elements. And actually uh, before the run, you don't know which part of the, of the element, which, which subset of the element will resign of the, on the single MPI rank. And this is given by the local numbering and by the local number of elements. So uh, sometimes this local number of elements in NEG because of its, its static allocation produce a problem. If you will compile the code and you will find this 
reallocation trunca uh, truncation error. So that means that actually this LELT was too high. Uh, static allocation means that you have the limited amount of memory you can use for the given array. And of course you have two ways of making the arrays bigger or smaller in, in MEC. One is to increase or, or decrease your polynomial order, but that's what actually you would like to keep at given value uh, because you know, of, your phys of the physics you would like to have. So then the only way to, to control how big the arrays are is to, is, is to give how many elements per given core you can have. And LELT is a maximum number. So if you get a reallocation error, that means that your LELT is too high. You will have to decrease it and then to recompile the code. So the next uh, file, which I mentioned, which is necessary for compilation is the user file. User file is simply a set of subroutines which are required for running the code. And actually MakeNet is, is uh, smart enough to go through the user file to check uh, if the routine is, is, uh, routine is present. And if it's not present in your uh, user file, it's supposed to add, append to your user file with the empty uh, subroutine, which is, which is required by NEC. So in general, the set of routines you supposed to provide, not all of them use is, for example, to have the variable pro properties like uh, varying densities or varying uh, viscosity stuff. That's where you can define it. Uh, you can provide forcing, which in this case, actually acceleration. Uh, you can, if you have a heat equation included in your set of equation, you can add a seat, heat sinks or sources. Then you have a main interface for the user. User check is a routine, which is called after every time step in Mac. And that's the place where you can add your stuff. That means you can uh, calculate, uh, drag, uh, or you can recalculate forcing if the forcing is dependent on time or, or it's, it's dependent on, on, on velocity values and so on. Uh, this we will see later on that it's, it's really important. Then you have the boundary conditions, initial conditions, and then you have a three uh, routines which are user dot. They have different usage inside NEC, but their main idea behind them is to give you ability to, to uh, deform the mesh. And each of those meshes, those routines actually called a different steps of building the mesh. When you provide information to NEC about the mesh, what you provide is just the position of the vertices of each element. You don't provide information of the every grid points inside your mesh. And those grid points actually have to be built inside NEC. And that is why you have three different uh, user dot variables, which allows you to modify the mesh. User dot is called after the, the uh, information about the position of the vertices is read, but before the GLL points, the, the grid, real grid points are calculated. And that's the place where you can actually do some modification, add some information to the code. But before the GLL are generated, meaning that you can, for example, move the vertex and then the GLL, then you will have a new shape of your element. User dot is actually after GLL points, a real grid points inside your, uh, your code are, are generated. And in this subroutine, you actually can change final geometry of your run. You can deform it. You can take a pipe and, and, and bend it, for example because you can shift every single GL point. User that three is a last routine after the pressure, inform, uh, pressure preconditioner is initialized. And that allows you to give uh, to the code the last touches. Uh, on the other hand, user check is called both during the initialization of the run and during your time loop after every single iteration. So how looks every single of those routines? Here we have the example of the uh, user F, which provide the acceleration of the code. And you actually see that through the argument list, 
there is only a few arguments you actually get. Okay, I'm sorry. So you get actually the global number of element, not the local, the global num, uh, the global one. And then you have only the information about a single grid point. That means those ix, iy, iz go from one to lx1. And they simply point to a single value inside the array. There is nothing more. There is no uh, acceleration here. There is no velocity here. So how we actually uh, provide the information about the global memory ad addresses, all those things, those are done through the include files. And actually, if you would like to work more with NEC, you will have to learn more different include files actually contain, because each of them contains a set of common blocks. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the uh, with the concept of common block is simply a memory which is allocated inside uh, the, inside uh, the, the code. But the common block has only information about where this memory starts and where this memory ends. And it, the, the, the information about uh, what is inside has to be included inside the code. That is why it's usually this information is as extracted from the core code to the external file, like include file, and then you simply reuse this part of the information in many ways, just to, it's just a safety feature that you will not call different variables in the same uh, memory space, which unfortunately is allowed, or maybe fortunately, because this allows you to have a scratch space, but the common block does not contain information about what variables are located there. It's all the beginning and the end. So you have to be very careful about using them. So what we have here, we simply have a set of common blocks. One of those we all, let's say include files. One of those we all uh, talked about, size file, which tells what the different arrays sizes are. And all of the other ones actually depend on the size file. And that is why the size file has to be added as a first include file in the list, because all of the arrays sizes in all those uh, other include files actually go back to the first include file. And what we get through this, first of all, we have here something what is called NAC use, which allows us to use all of those acceleration start. But then we have additional information. For example, parallel contains a kind of converter, which allows us to tell, okay, the element with the global number IEG is actually locally stored and given position, i.e. lead. So each of those include files allows you to actually exchange data and exchange information between given position in the code and the global memory. So what are those include files? Uh, the most important ones which we will talk are, for example, NECUSE. And NECUSE actually copies the values for the given grid points to the value like x, y, z, if a uh, coordinates of the given grid points inside your, inside your mesh. And you can give back required information for this given grid points. Like for example, fxx, ffy, ffz will give acceleration. And that's what we actually did, uh, done in our previous slide. We got global element number, which we later on translated to the local element number, we got the information which point it actually is, ix, iy, iz, and then for this given point, we've given back through NECUSE include file acceleration information. What are the other include files? The most important one will be, for example, SOLN, which contains all of the solution arrays. And you see, for example, here you have on the bottom velocity field, which is order, uh, ordered by number of elements and the grid points in every direction. So you have element and the uh, index going through the different elements. The other one, the mentioned parallel, which allows you to keep the information. What is the relation between our local set of elements and the global array of all of the elements? Where do you really are? The other important include file is geom, 
which contains information about the coordinates. And you see, you have this XM1, XM2, or so X, Y, Z coordinates. And once again, those X, Y, Z coordinates are exactly the same represented like velocity. And that's exactly what uh, Niklas mentioned, that velocity and geometry are represented in SEM in exactly the same way. You have the same set of base function of, or those ansatz function, and you expand your, uh, your uh, fields with those, uh, with the amplitudes which are given by the values of those arrays. However, because we are using those GLL points, we are happy that the amplitudes of our functions are at the same time values at a given point. So you can use those arrays XM1 or uh, Y1, uh, VX, VY, VZ to plot the variables we would like to get. Now I see I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, let's go quickly, very quickly through the old, uh, through the parameter files. The old one is a RIA file. I mention it only because you actually will see this when we will go to this uh, first uh, use uh, first example to run. It's actually very old. It still has this RIA file. So you have few sections. You have the parameter section here. You see, it's, it's, it's just a set of the reals which you have to specify. You have to first, of course, if how many different parameters there are in the file. Then you have a set of the logical variables, and then you have a mesh description. Actually, this is already newer version of the code because you see this number of elements. Here you have this mesh data part, and number of elements is a negative. It's minus 36 elements, which means that actually the mesh section was taken to the separate file, which is RE2, which is a binary file, and, the, and I already skipped the, the, the mesh section. If we would have the original version of the code, here you would have a long, long, long description of all of the vertices, all of the boundary conditions, and all of the deformation. And what was very annoying, then after the mesh, you had a next section of the runtime parameters, like restart. So you had to scroll in for the big meshes, it was simply impossible to do. So, so to, to go to have the runtime parameter in the beginning section and the finalizing section of, of, of the file. But now it's better. We now we work with the par file. Uh, everything is better because we have simply everything defined in the subsection. Everything is easy to read. Uh, you have a number of different variables. You have uh, those variables are defined per section. Here you you, you have uh, all of the, no, maybe not all the main the most important. Uh, sections names, that means for the general, which will tell you how many time steps you do, uh, how often you write your the plot files, and so on and so on and so on. I will not go through this. For this, I will refer you to the, to the documentation. But you know that's a, a big step forward. Uh, and the last slide uh, for this presentation is about meshing. Uh, Niklas already mentioned Meshing is a problem. The problem because everything is based on the hexes. Everything has to be tet or hex, and it's not actually trivial to do meshing for 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 NEC. NEC has a few tools which I already mentioned. It's this GenBox. GenBox is a very simple tool which allows you to produce simple boxes, single tensor products, uh, boxes with a given number of elements in every direction. Uh, it's very simple box, uh, simple tool, but but at the same time, we use it pretty often. Uh, Prenec is something what is uh, extension of of GenBox to use for uh, other kind of of uh, geometries. However, I would not suggest to use it. It's pretty complex uh, and it's not very very useful. Of course, you can use as well the MATLAB or other tools because the the format for the mesh description for NAC is very simple. It just contains the information about the vertices of every given element. Uh, you list the, them for all of the elements. Then you provide information about the boundary condition, which actually is very limited when it comes to use because the only external boundary condition 
and periodic boundary condition count. The rest is produced during the GenMap stuff. So you can write your own stuff. However, the most probably useful is to use a different uh, existing uh, measures and, and to run a GMesh to neck or exa to neck or CT engine to neck converters. And actually that's what we will cover during the next hands-on session uh, after the lunch. Uh, and the last stuff, which I already to some extent mentioned is morphing and is the forming. And uh, what, what you can do is simply can take uh, a simple mesh like a box, and then you can change, you can shift every GLL point inside your domain to, perf to, to get a new, uh, new mesh for your specific case. And the example of this is, is, is this stenosis on, on, on the right. Uh, the input mesh is just a simple pipe. And then you actually do this, the, this narrow section inside neck directly. The other uh, example, which actually I will show you today later on, will be this, this uh, periodic kill, which once again, you, you provide to neck a simple box, and then the rest of the deformation uh, is done using this user dot, user dot two, and user dot three uh, subroutines. So that ends uh, my presentation. Um, any question? Okay, it seems no questions at all. Okay, then I think I would probably. Okay, meshes, converters, accuracy. Uh, what exactly you mean? You know, meshing is, is a, a, a not easy task for um, SEM. The reason for that is that, that you have actually a lot of degrees of freedom. Changing a shape of the element uh, inside your domain, you can have the, exactly the same, the same domain. You can. Uh, rearrange differently the, the element borders, and then you actually can get a uh, different accuracy of your simulation. You can play with the formation with elongation uh, of your mesh to increase the local, uh, you know, the, the, the local increasing or, or decreasing the resolution. So um, it's a really, uh, I would say, big subject, how to mesh. Uh, what we try to use locally is GMesh. Uh, I know some other uh, some other groups. Okay, why doesn't want to change? Uh, use Qubit or other uh, ISAM as well. We were testing at some point. Um, GMesh to neck is that's the one which I know the, the best. It's a relatively good converter, even though it has its limitations. Uh, as usual, uh, you know that if you want to have all of the possible uh, features of NEC, then you would need to use GenBox and pre-NEC, but that would be a rather um, annoying work. Uh, so yeah, what for example, uh, GMesh cannot do, uh, it cannot provide you a cyclic boundary condition. You can do this with pre-NEC, you cannot do uh, this with uh, uh, GMesh, so yeah. There are, there are cons and you know, good and bad sides for everything. Uh, I haven't tested uh, CGN to neck and exo to neck, so I have no much experience with that. GMesh to neck work relatively well. I'm not sure if I, I've under answered the question. Okay, any, any more questions? Okay, then I, I guess we can 
uh, finish this session unless Philip wants to say anything more. Okay, so the so then after lunch at one we will start the hands-on session, and please uh, download before the hands-on session NEC code, which is directly from the NEC webpage. This uh, NEC five thousand V nineteen targets that, and then as well take this example code. That what will be work uh, on the next session uh, and we start sharp one okay thank you i guess philip has to stop recording <laughs>